At the Sony A9 press event, Sony told us that the new global shutter in the A9 III gave us instant readout, 120 frames per second with no compromise. And I believed them. It gives us global shutter without compromise. People said, you're going to compromise ISO. You're going to compromise dynamic range. Well, we overcame that. We're Sony. We're the largest sensor manufacturer in the world. Of course we're going to do it. We're the only ones that can do it. But since then, some news has come out that has made us second guess the image quality. And so we're doing some retesting. I previously tested the A93 against the Sony A1, which seemed like the closest competitor to me. You can go watch that video if you want information about how those two cameras compare. But a lot of you wanted to see the Sony A93 compared against a 24 megapixel camera. I don't have the older A9s, but they do have a very old sensor. But I do have a Canon R3, which I'm actually filming this on now. So I compared the raw image quality against the Canon R3. And I'm going to compare it against an APS-C camera so we can see if the image quality really is better than an APS-C camera or not. First, let's look at the base ISO of the A9 Mark III and the Canon R3. So we can check dynamic range and the amount of detail. The A9 Mark III has a base ISO of 250, and I'll tell you why that is in just a second. The Canon R3 has a base ISO of ISO 100. At a glance, even at 500% zoom, the two cameras produce pretty much indistinguishable images, but you know what? We can really nitpick this and we can really distinguish between these two. And if you look really closely at these like focusing charts, not a real world thing, we can see that, it, well, indeed, the A9 Mark III seems to have more detail. The R3 doesn't have quite as much detail. But the A9 Mark III has more moire, more of that like false color that happens with fine lines. Like look at the patches of yellow here that aren't really there on the Canon R3. What that probably means to me is that the A9 Mark III has less of an anti-aliasing filter. The Canon R3 has a heavier anti-aliasing filter. They also call it the OLPF or optical low pass filter. It basically like blurs the picture a little bit. When you have those fine black and white lines that are trying to be rendered by a sensor with a bare filter like both of these have, some photons are gonna land on just the blue or just the green pixels and that's going to make the camera think that there's color there when there's not. And that's why we see those weird colors. So by adding a little filter that actually blurs the image, that it helps to reduce that, but it also reduces detail. So we see a slightly different product choice here. Canon, Sony, they both made sports cameras, 24 megapixels. Canon decided to give it a heavier filter Sort of makes the workflow a little easier because sports photographers won't have to do as much post-processing. Sony said, we'd rather have a little more detail and if there are fine lines like that, they can fix it in post. But now let's look at the dynamic range. To assess that, I'm going to just raise the exposure in post on both of these raw files and then zoom in on the shadows. This is something sports photographers don't really have to do that often but you might do it if you accidentally underexpose something. It's really more of a concern for like landscape photographers, wedding photographers who have to pull up details in black suits and such, but let's just see where they stand. Got my little transformer guy here. And if you look in these heavily recovered shadows, we can see the Canon R3 is really very noticeably cleaner. And if you were a professional photographer, a wedding photographer, for example, picking a camera and you knew you'd be recovering the details in the suits, I would totally pick the R3. Image quality, I could go either way, but dynamic range has a clear win for the R3. This is happening because of the base ISO. The R3 is gathering more than twice as much light with its base ISO of 100, and that means the images are going to be cleaner and that's going to be more noticeable in recovered shadows, and that's why the A9 has worse dynamic range. Now, I previously tested the A9 at higher ISOs against other cameras, and the dynamic range seems to be the same, so that's kind of an uninteresting result. There's not something about the sensor that makes the dynamic range at a given elevated ISO different, it's just the base ISO cannot collect as much light because it has a higher base ISO. I already know what you're saying. Base ISO does not matter to sports photographers. Sports photographers are the, the users of this particular camera and they're always shooting it at one two thousandths, one four thousandths of a second. I can do objective measurements. I have the equipment. I can test it. That's objective. Subjectively, you might think, okay, but that doesn't matter. Why are you even mentioning it? I, subjectively, that's not up for me to say. Subjectively, 
sports photographers don't necessarily use the base ISO very much anyway because they're always shooting at one two thousandths, one four thousandths of a second. And even in sunlight, you might be at ISO 400 or 800, so maybe they would never notice. But I will say it depends on the sports photographer. Like, I like cars. And frequently when you're shooting a moving car, you want the wheels to be visibly moving. You want to capture motion in many types of sports. But with cars, the sort of default you start with is the reciprocal of the speed in miles per hour. So if a car is going 60 miles an hour, you might start shooting at a shutter speed of 160th to get a nice little bit of wheel spin there. And if it were in daylight, you wouldn't be able to do that with a base ISO of 250, but you might be able to with a base ISO of 100. That's not the end of the world. If you have an A9 Mark III and you need to get slower shutter speeds in order to capture motion in sports, then you could put an ND filter on the front of the lens and, and that would work fine. Except, of course, you then have to manage the ND filter. You're putting it on and you're taking it off as light drops or conditions change or you want a different type of shot and it's just a little less convenient than being able to dial in the ISO on the back of the camera, right? So, Objectively, it's better to have the option to go to ISO 100. You can't say it doesn't matter to anybody. It will matter to some people. I provide you the information and you can make up your own mind about it. So why is the base ISO higher? Sony never explained this to me despite me asking them. But DP Review pointed me to an article on amateurphotographer.com. They talked to Professor Robert Newman who somehow knows how this system works and has a nice little diagram here. In a nutshell, each of the photo sites is essentially two photo sites, one that collects light and one that does not. And the one that collects light sort of transfers the light over to the waiting area, which is the other half of the pixel. Because of this extra circuitry, there's not as much total capacity for light. Like the waiting area photo site is consuming some of what they call the well capacity, which is the maximum amount of light that each photo site can hold at any given time. That maximum amount of light, the well capacity, is what determines what the base ISO of the camera can be. Because if any other photons come in, they can't be saved and thus you start to lose any detail. Now if it was consuming exactly half the well capacity, we'd probably see a base ISO of 200 instead of 250, but it must be slightly more than half maybe because there's some extra circuitry in there. This novel pixel photo site design also lends itself to a weakness in high ISOs. The article says that cramming in that extra circuitry to sort of split each photo site into two and provide the global shutter readout, that extra circuitry precludes the use of dual gain modes. When you get into high ISOs, like low light situations like ISO 1600, the sensor actually like switches the way that it works and it goes into the dual gain mode and just provides cleaner output in those low light conditions. And that, that accounts for the improvement in low light noise that we've seen in, in like all modern sensors. But it seems like the design choices in the A93 enable the global shutter, but don't allow the dual gain thing. So let's see how it looks at higher ISOs compared to the Canon R3. We'll zoom in here and it should be pretty easy to see the noise in patches of gray like this. And just at a glance, yeah, it seems like the A9 Mark III, even at ISO 1600, does indeed seem to have noticeably more noise, but it's not a huge difference. But let's try a really high ISO, like ISO 6400. Here at ISO 6400, it's not a huge difference, but the R3 is noticeably cleaner, noticeably better. Let's go all the way up to ISO 25600. Here we can see the A9 Mark III is looking really significantly worse. The difference here is even more noticeable than it was at the more moderate ISOs. And we definitely see a lack of detail, whereas the A9 III was more detailed than the R3 is, was before. Like if you try to read 400 here, it's pretty clearly readable on the R3, whereas on the A9, I don't think I'd be able to read any of those numbers. They look pretty mushed up. I'm zooming way in here because people are watching vertically on their phones and I'm like this big. But look at, look at the way the R3 renders the 7 and look at the way the A93 renders the 7. Again, let's talk about objective versus subjective. I'm objectively measuring the A9 Mark III's performance at high ISOs and how it compares to the R3 and it seems like it does noticeably worse. Subjectively, people are saying sports photographers don't care about that. Noise reduction algorithms are good enough now that it doesn't matter. That's subjective. I'm going to leave that up for you to decide. I think it would be fine. I would happily shoot with the A9 Mark III. And in fact, when we tested it against the Canon R3, 
I, I would never shoot 120 frames per second with the Canon R3. I didn't find that mode useful at all, but I found it incredibly useful on the R3. Overall, if you assess many different factors, I think the A9 Mark III is a far superior sports camera than the Canon R3. But I do find it interesting to know the strengths and the weaknesses of the global shutter. So don't take this as a broad panning of the A9 Mark III. It is an absolutely amazing camera. But for those of you who might be buying it or renting it, I do want you to know the strengths and weaknesses so you know what you can and can't get out of it. Now, some of you are saying well, Adobe Denoise is amazing. Well, let, let's take a look. Let's process those images with Denoise and see if they become good enough in your eyes. I'll start with the ISO 25600 image. This is so easy in Adobe now. First, let's compare the A9 Mark III at ISO 25600 with Denoise on and off. Okay, that is a drastic difference. And clearly, the image on the right is far more usable than the image on the left. And I, I would actually consider this to be pretty, pretty good. And the fact that you can shoot this at, in really low light conditions is amazing. But of course, these comparisons to other cameras are very valid because people are choosing from two different cameras and you could also apply denoise to the Canon. So how does that compare? If I zoom in on the same part of the test chart, you can see it's garbage in, garbage out. Even with denoise, the R3's image quality is significantly better than the A9 Mark III. Like look at the shape of the seven here. Um, Denoise has tried to like make some AI guesses about what the shapes of these numbers should be and has not done a great job of it. That's objective. But subjectively, what you're really asking is, is this good enough? Will this get the job done for me? If I'm shooting a concert and there are flickering lights, which is going to be more of a problem, the banding that could occur on the R3 or the amount of detail and noise that would happen on the A9 Mark III. Those are subjective questions. I definitely think the A9 Mark III, even in low light, with the noise, is definitely good enough. And it would be outperformed by the R3, but you have the safety of never having any flickering or any rolling shutter on the A9 Mark III, and I think that counts for a lot. In my first comparison against the Sony A1, I kind of made a guesstimation that the A9 Mark III was performing about a stop worse than the A1, and that would put it on par with an APS-C camera. This time around, I wanted to actually test it against an APS-C camera, so I pulled out my Fujifilm X-H2. I know they have different megapixels, but all my APS-C cameras with 24 megapixels have like older, lower quality sensors. So it seemed like the best comparison. And well, let's see what we got. First, notice the exposure settings here are pretty much exactly the same, but the Fuji camera is noticeably darker. That's because, as I've said before, ISO is fake. ISO numbers are not the same between different vendors and Fuji in particular underrates its ISO by almost a full stop. So just to get these cameras to match the exposure, I'm going to have to brighten up the Fuji camera. It doesn't substantially change the image quality that we're experiencing because uh, these are raw files and they have some latitude for these things. So let's zoom in and see how they each look. Mm, they're pretty close. This isn't a huge difference, but the Sony is definitely cleaner than the Fujifilm camera, and Fuji is state-of-the-art for APS-C cameras. So I'm going to walk back what I said about the A9 Mark III being equal to an APS-C camera. I'm going to say it's, it's noticeably worse in image quality than other full-frame cameras, but still better than APS-C cameras. So falling somewhere between full-frame and APS-C is how you can think about it. If you have follow-up questions, write a comment down below. And, and also, I gotta say, I don't think this is that important. I'm interested in it as a curiosity, but it's not the biggest factor on whether or not you should buy an A9 Mark III. You should buy it because you need the unique characteristics, which are 120 frames per second, a global shutter with no rolling shutter. Those are unique features that I think more than outweigh the image quality. This is a niche camera. This isn't your family minivan that you do everything with. This is a camera that you use for those circumstances when you need it. Or, or maybe you just rent it because you're shooting a concert or you're shooting some sort of fast action sport. This is totally a valuable camera and something we didn't have before. I love it. I adore it. I wanted to provide you with some more information so you can make educated buying choices because I want you to focus on the things that really matter in photography, the storytelling, the composition, the lighting, being there. And if you want to know more about that, check out our store at northrop.photo, which has lots of photography education, award-winning, best-selling, stunning digital photography, has more than 20 hours of video. Check out our art and science of photography video training series. And of course, we have books on Lightroom and Photoshop, so you can figure out all the cool post-processing things I'm doing here. 
Don't forget to subscribe. We have more reviews of the A9 Mark III coming up as well as our ZF is finally in and our live show is starting back up every Thursday at 5. Be sure to subscribe. Bye.